for today's lecture, I'm going to focus on uh, Chapter 1 in Volume 2 of Great Expectations. Uh, the second volume of the novel focuses on the second stage of Pip's life, and it primarily takes place in London. And so the novel opens with Pip arriving in London, and, and what we, he reveals at the get-go is that London is beneath, or sort of doesn't actually measure up to his expectations. Remember that Pip has great expectations, and you know when you have a really, really um, idealistic idea of things, often you're disappointed. So we're going to see that, that Pip is going to be disappointed again and again. And in this um, first couple paragraphs here, I'm just going to read a short bit here. So this is on uh, page 149. We Britons had at that time particularly settled that it was treasonable to doubt our having and our being the best of everything. During this time, England was the powerhouse. I mean, they they had the most land. They were, you know, a, a super giant, right? Like, I can't remember what uh, portion of the world was under British rule, but it was significant, okay? And so the British had, you know, this idea that they indeed were the best at everything and, and so on. And and so, you know, nobody would really admit to any kinds of weaknesses. So everything he's heard about London just sounds magnificent, right? Plus, we know that gentlemen come out of London and and uh, Pip's very idealized version of a gentleman would again uh, pr would again project this incredible beauty and and um, greatness onto London. But in fact, he says, you know, had it not been for that, um, I think I might have had some faint doubts whether it was not rather ugly, crooked, narrow, and dirty. Uh, many uh, 19th century novelists who kind of wrote in this period, along with Dickens, write about London, um, portraying it in this way as this very dirty, unclean, um, just sort of, you know, uh, not pleasing city. And so this fits very much with with the sort of um, city of London during that period. So then he arrives at Jagger's office, and this is on an especially gloomy street. Now, if you recall, we've met Jagger's on two previous occasions, first at Miss Havisham's when he was incredibly rude to Pip, and then the second time when he met up with Joe and Pip at the Three Jolly Bargemen and then went back to the house with them and informed um, them of Pip's inheritance. And... And during that time, he was also not very pleasant. He wasn't extremely nice to Joe. He wasn't overly nice to Pip. So we don't particularly know him as a pleasant person. Even the coachman, you know, expressed like a lot of fear about Jaggers. And so Pip is really wondering, you know, what is this guy? Who is this guy? And then when he gets to his office, it reinforces this, this whole like um, fear of Jaggers as being this really terrifying persona. So I'm just going to read a short bit about his office. So he goes in there on page 150. It was lighted by a skylight only and was a most dismal place. The skylight eccentrically patched like a broken head and the distorted adjoining houses looking as if they had twisted themselves to peep down at me through it. There were not so many papers about as I should have expected to see and there were such some odd objects about that I should not have expected to see, such as an old rusty pistol, a sword in a scabbard, several strange-looking boxes and packages, and two dreadful casts. These are um, uh, statue, like little faces, you know, busts, I think you call them. Um, so he sees these uh, faces peculiarly swollen and twitchy about the nose. Okay, so there's some weird things here, right? Then he says that, his, uh, that Mr. Jagger's own high-backed chair was of deadly black horsehair with rows of brass nails round it like a coffin. So I could go on and on, but basically the metaphors he's using here are, uh, you know, like a coffin and sort of all of those kinds of things that so suggest death, it suggests creepy. We've got these creepy objects, more symbols of crime and punishment, the gun, the sword, all of these kinds of things that we've seen repeatedly, right? We also meet Jagger's clerk, and and Jagger's clerk is also not a very pleasant person. He describes, Pip says of him at page 151 that um, 
that um, I called to mind that the clerk had the same air of knowing something to everybody else's disadvantage. Do you know people like that? You know, that it just seems like they always have something on you. Like they remember something you did or they can sort of perceive something in you. And, you know, they're just kind of look into your very soul and see your vice. And, and you know, it's not a real virtuous quality, right? But this is certainly the way that Jaggers is and his clerk Wemmick as well. So we know that Jaggers is a criminal lawyer. Many of his clients are victimized, they're desperate, a number of them are falsely accused, potentially, it's hard to say. But, you know, some of them have certainly um, committed crimes, and they're looking to Jaggers to help them get off, okay? He also has criminal informants, you know, these kind of seedy sort of criminals that, um, you know, will accept payment for some dirty work, so they do a lot of his dirty work. Um, he is very harsh and unyielding to his clients. He doesn't allow them to talk. He's quite rude most of the time. Uh, when they are, uh, you know, walking everywhere they go, everywhere Jaggers goes, people are just lining up to get his attention. So it's like incredible. Okay. Um, so Pip goes for a walk around uh, the office while he's waiting. And this whole sort of district is by Newgate Prison, which is a very important place. Uh, prison in British history and in British literature in particular. Okay, so there's many things we could say about that, but I'll wait until later. Um, the other thing is, I mentioned in previous lectures that the novel contains all these symbols of justice or, you know, like kinds of symbols of crime and punishment. So the leg iron, the cuffs, the gallows, guns, like all these things, right? And Pip is going to encounter more and more and more symbols. And he's going to hear all these stories about crime and punishment. So even on page 151, near the bottom he's um, going along and it says that um, so this guy shows him this minister of justice he says um he was so good as to take me into a yard and show me where the gallows was kept and also where people were publicly whipped uh, and then he showed me the debtor's door out of which culprits came to be hanged so remember we've had a number of references to gallows. So this sort of motif is continuing to appear to us, right? Um, and those, of course, where people get hanged, okay? So I want you to think about this question. Is the justice system always fair? So this is a, a sort of a, an example. If two people are on trial, both for murder, and one man is highly educated, um, wealthy, well-connected, and the other man hasn't even completed high school, is poor, knows no one, will each man have the same experience in court? The rich guy can afford the best legal representation, you know, and his intelligence and education might help him to say the right things, to know where to go to get the resources, right? He can ask credible people, presumably, to act as character witnesses for him. But then we have the uneducated poor man. He doesn't have any of those advantages. So then, is it fair? And I think that Dickens wants us to think about this because it's going to cost you a lot of money if you want Jaggers to represent you. But Jaggers is the best. So is that fair that some people can afford him and some people can't? And should that matter? Should a justice system actually favor somebody who's wealthy? Even if it is not, it doesn't intentionally do that, does it sort of inadvertently do that, right? So kind of think about these. And, you know, Dickens really wants us to think about the legal justice system here. He also wants us to think about the social justice system in this novel. And we're going to talk more about that in subsequent lectures. So, um, as we carry on, I'm just going to, uh, Jaggers, you know, tells Pip where he's going to stay. We'll look at that next chapter. Um, and then he gives him the money. And look on page 156, the third last paragraph here. Jaggers says, um, okay, so here's your money. You will find your credit good, Mr. Pip, said my guardian, whose flask of sherry, okay, whatever. But I shall by this means be able to check your bills and to pull you up if I find you out running the constable. Of course, you'll go wrong somehow, but that's no fault of mine. Jaggers is foreshadowing the uh, Dick, or sorry, Pip's um, financial irresponsibility, debt, etc. It's like, oh, you're going to go wrong. 
And I wonder if some of you can identify a little bit with Pip's position. You know, maybe you've been sent off to university. Maybe you've even come from another country and you're given an allowance and, and you have no one to supervise you. And, you know, some of you are going to rise to the occasion. But, you know, you're going to have that integrity, that maturity, that wisdom to make good choices. But you know what? Some of you, unfortunately, are going to slack off, skip class, waste money, party, and, and you know, not have a successful year. And you know what? I've, do, I've been in both of those categories. I'm not judging. But I'm just saying, can we understand how vulnerable Pip is? This young guy, he's on his own. He's given all this money. He has no supervision. And... And what else is he going to do but spend money, right? So I think that we can um, empathize with him. Okay, we're going to uh, stop there for Chapter 1 and pick it up on Chapter 2 shortly. All right, take care.